Misco Electric here. Today is Sunday, July 7th, 2024, and this is The Current, weekly EV news. Our goal is to provide the most helpful 10 minutes of EV and electrification stories available anywhere. This week's episode is coming to you from a hotel room in Chicago, where we're helping to break an unlikely story with unlikely partners. Stick around for a few minutes and I'll tell you more about it. First, I'd like to have a look at second quarter US EV sales results with you. Hyundai Group brands sold well over 33,000 EVs during Q2. Their Kia brand's EV sales hit a new record of 17,980 units this quarter, which is up 131% more than a year ago. Kia sold 6,882 EV6s, 5,664 EV9s, and 5,434 Nero EVs. More recently, Kia has refreshed their EV6 and Nero EV while introducing a new third row electric SUV to the market, which seems to have helped with their growth. Hyundai sold over 15,000 Ionic 5 and 6s combined, and in particular, a record number of Ionic 5s in Q2. Unfortunately, the brand doesn't separate out their Kona EV sales from the gas-powered versions, which makes the total for Hyundai Group a bit murky compared to other brands. Ford sold 23,957 electric vehicles in the second quarter, which is up 61% from Q2 of 2023. The F-150 Lightning was up 77% to 7,902 units, and the Mustang Mach-E sales were up 46%, with 12,645 models sold. The growth continued for the E-Transit, with 3,410 units sold in Q2, up 96% year-over-year. So far this year, Ford has sold 44,180 EVs, up 72% from last year during this same time. New lease incentives, discounted interest rates, and with new trim options and simplified packaging, that seems to be paying off. General Motors is closing the gap with Ford. They delivered 21,930 EVs in Q2. They've largely addressed software and battery manufacturing issues for their Ultium models and appear to be ramping steadily. GM sold 6,634 Chevy Blazer EVs, 1,013 Equinox EVs, and 2,196 Silverado EVs this quarter. It is worth noting that 40% of Blazer EV buyers are new to GM. GM's luxury brand Cadillac had its best retail sales quarter since 2015. They sold 7,294 Lyrics, which made it Cadillac's second best-selling model behind the Escalade. Plus, GM said that over half of Lyric buyers with a trade-in were from rivals like Tesla and Lexus during the second quarter. 2,929 Hummer EVs were sold this quarter, and nearly 70% of Hummer EV buyers are new to GM. GM plans to offer 10 EV nameplates by the end of 2024, which means three more are incoming, if I've counted correctly. Two or more of these might be the GMC Sierra EV and the Escalade IQ. In order to meet the volume projections GM has announced, they'll need to ramp up 20x to meet their electrification targets for 2025. Do you think they have a shot to do that in 18 months? BMW sold 14,081 electric vehicles in the U.S., which represents about a 24% increase over the same quarter last year and amounts to over 15% of BMW's total U.S. sales. The i4 leads the way with 7,066 sold, followed by the iX with 3,545 vehicles, the i5 with 2,541 units, and 929 i7s. Nissan sold 5,203 Arias, which is up in Q2 by 123%. Leaf sales were also up slightly, with 1,925 units sold this quarter. Lower sales for the Leaf make sense, because the vehicle is being phased out and a successor is under development. Toyota also had growing sales in the second quarter, with 7,571 BZ4Xs sold, which is up 289%. Their luxury brand Lexus sold 4,036 RZs, which is up 333%. So yes, if you were wondering, people are even buying Toyota's EVs. In fact, Toyota already sold more BZ4Xs this year than in all of 2023. 
Sibling to the BZ4X, the Subaru Solterra had sales in the U.S. that reached 4,238, up 163% more than a year ago. There were many great incentives for those ETNGA platform models that helped to move inventory last quarter. Honda didn't have much to show for their EV sales considering their Prologue EV based on GM's Ultium platform just kicked off sales in April, along with its sibling, the Acura ZDX, in May. Last month, 830 Honda Prologues and 255 Acura ZDXs were sold in the U.S. Tesla is still the clear volume EV brand, selling about 175,000 units in the U.S. That means they've moved about six times the product of their nearest competitor. Tesla's global deliveries were down about 5% to 444,000 from 466,000 in Q2 of last year. Volkswagen sold 5,690 ID4s last quarter, a 15% drop compared to Q2 of 2023. This is the brand's second consecutive quarter of year-over-year -year EV decline in the USA. VW sub-brand Audi sold 5,714 all-electric cars in the U.S. in Q2, amounting to about 4% less than a year ago as well. Sister company Porsche has not yet reported. Polestar sales are down 18% to 13,000 units. At the moment, both of the models they sell in the U.S. are made in China, and the newly implemented 100% tariffs will cause them pain until their new factories in South Carolina, South Korea, and Belgium begin shipping vehicles to the USA. Finally, Rivian hit their targets by delivering 13,790 vehicles in Q2, up slightly from Q1. A slowdown was expected because Rivian shut down its normal Illinois manufacturing plant for significant product and line upgrades. Did any of these figures surprise you? Which brands do you think will shake up the ranks as 2024 carries on? A new battery cell manufacturing facility has broken ground in Mississippi, which will cater specifically to electric heavy-duty commercial trucks. Amplify Cell Technologies is a joint venture between Accelera by Cummins, Daimler Truck, and Packar, which manufactures light, medium, and heavy-duty trucks under the Kenworth, Peterbilt, and DAF nameplate and was announced back in September of 2023. Governor Tate Reeves, alongside local officials and industry leaders, celebrated the start of construction at the 500-acre site. The facility is expected to create over 2,000 jobs with an average salary of $66,000. The 2 million square foot energy efficient factory aims to produce lithium iron phosphate battery cells with an annual manufacturing capacity of 21 gigawatt hours, with production beginning in 2027. A few weeks ago on The Current, we reported that Stellantis made a large investment in electric vertical takeoff and landing manufacturer Archer Aviation. Well, Stellantis is putting more money towards this venture. Stellantis will contribute an additional $55 million investment under the company's strategic funding agreement following the achievement of its transition flight test milestone last month. This investment builds on the $39 million worth of open market purchase of Archer stock that Stellantis completed earlier this year and the $110 million investment made by Stellantis and Archer during 2023. Last month, Archer signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Signature Aviation, which owns 200 private terminals worldwide. Together, the companies want to establish Archer's air taxi service in major U.S. metropolitan areas, starting with United Airlines hubs at Newark International and Chicago O'Hare airports. Other areas include Los Angeles, the San Francisco Bay Area, and Texas. The first locations are scheduled to be up and running in 2025 and will feature Beta's CCS-based charging technology. Beta dispensers are operational in 20 airports in the U.S. with 50 new sites in development. Archer has received FAA approval for commercial flight at the beginning of June this year. Their manufacturing plant in Georgia is still on track to be completed before the end of the year. Let's do something new for this next story. Well, this is the very first time that we are shooting on location for The Current, and you might notice that I have something covered up behind me. That's because we're in Chicago right now for the NASCAR Cup Series. Now, all these seats are going to be filled with media, and soon they're going to be pulling the cover on this ABB 
all electric number 35 NASCAR and ABB invited me here to get all the details on it. When the cover was pulled back, crowds were surprised to see a crossover utility form factor. It seems like everybody wants to buy a CUV nowadays and North American stock car auto racing would be an ideal series to race them. After all, the stock car ethos is race on Sunday, drive one to work on Monday. With two motors in the rear and one in the front, the prototype delivers over 1300 horsepower peak, nearly twice as much as today's Cup Series competitors. It's built upon a version of the NASCAR's next-gen platform, but is not designed to compete along Cup Series races with its 78 kilowatt hour battery. So far, there hasn't been an all-electric series announcement. Over the weekend, I've interviewed leadership from NASCAR, ABB, Ford, Toyota, and Chevy to learn more about the technical attributes and strategic implications of number 35. We plan to publish detailed long-form coverage later this week, so please subscribe for those details. What are your thoughts on NASCAR going electric? Ineos is a British conglomerate with a portfolio of brands in many sectors, including fashion, petrochemicals, and off-road automotive. Their first combustion vehicle, the Grenadier, is a spiritual successor to Land Rover's original Defender. It went on sale last year and they've delivered over 1,000 vehicles in North America. I saw one in Nashville a few weeks ago and it looked pretty awesome, but I've been looking forward to something similar without the tailpipe. This week, they announced an indefinite delay of their upcoming small electric 4x4 SUV called the Fusilier. The company intended to develop their first EV with Austria's Magna Steyr, which had been manufacturing the Fisker Ocean before Fisker's recent bankruptcy. The company says, We are delaying the launch of the Ineos Fusilier for two reasons, reluctant consumer uptake of EVs and industry uncertainty around tariffs, timings, and taxation. There needs to be long-term clarity from policymakers. Let's look a bit more closely at the uncertainty this European brand is talking about. This week, Americans celebrated their independence. One major motivation behind the formation of the United States was the avoidance of European tariffs. Ironically, this week, the US and Europe have united over tariffs. This time around, the taxpayer is China. The European Union's new tariffs on Chinese manufactured EVs went into effect on Friday. The stated objective is negotiation of unfair Chinese government subsidies. Tariffs vary between 17 to 38 percent in proportion with subsidization based on EU research to date. This is a measured approach compared to the 100% tariff imposed by the US. In the EU, one out of every four new EVs sold is currently built in China. Some of those come from Chinese factories producing vehicles for BMW, Volkswagen, and Tesla. This impressive market share is realized even though Chinese automakers like Geely, BYD, and Seic significantly inflate the prices of their EVs in Europe. The margins are so great, in fact, that many models might remain profitable at the same price despite the tariffs. Maybe those brands saw this coming and created the cushion on purpose. European and US-made EVs are also subsidized by their governments, and the accounting is murky regarding how the scales might be tipped. The EU has begun tallying the tax due, but will not collect until after EU governments confirm the policy with a vote and if the European auto industry can prove that the net harm to their business would be greater without the tariffs. We think that this is a big if because of how intertwined most automakers are with China. Additionally, China will almost certainly respond with trade policy maneuvers of their own. As the world's leading source of new automobiles, China can deliver incomparable value to consumers. Their scale all but assures a dominance wherever they compete. Chinese EV tariffs will allow European, US, Japanese, and Korean automakers to hold European market share for a brief while, but there are plenty of back doors. Chinese OEMs like BYD, Cherry, and Geely are preparing factories elsewhere, including Mexico, Spain, South Korea, the US, Belgium, and Hungary to get around them. Many of those facilities will begin production this year. How do you think these policies will play out? Well, that's all for this week's edition of The Current. 
We will continue making this series as long as viewership continues to grow. If you haven't yet, we would greatly appreciate it if you considered subscribing and sharing this video if you found some value in this coverage. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, drive, fly, ride. Go electric.